Hello and welcome everyone to the second lesson of our online course on online teaching. Today we're going to talk about uh, planning your learning online, so how to create coherence and not to foster chaos with your digital classroom. Um, here with us to talk about it are Helen Nelson and Sally Thorne. And without further ado, you have the floor. Good morning. Uh, morning. Good morning as we're recording this. Are you well, Sally? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Helen? Good. Yes, it's very strange not being able to do these things face to face for everybody, isn't it? Very, yeah, very, very strange. odd. Yeah, but we're all learning. I'd never used Zoom before, so here we go. No, so yes, if we look like strange people, well, please believe us, we're not that strange in reality, but uh, yes, online things do odd things. So hopefully with that little bit of talking, um, it gives you a chance to get used to the, the tone and, and accent we have, and we'll try and speak fairly uh, slowly as well, so that uh, you can follow what we want to talk about this morning, um, which is planning learning online. Um, as Alice uh, gave us the brief, for coherence, hopefully, and not chaos. And um, we are still planning our learning over time as we're doing this. And um, I think that's something that it's quite easy to forget, despite the fact that we are now online as opposed to in the classroom. When lockdown first happened, there was certainly um, here in the UK a tendency to throw things together. There was a first uh, thought a shutdown happened that it would be for a couple of weeks. Um, and then quite rapidly everybody began to realise, no, this is a marathon race, this is not a sprint. And although the world's different right now, we still need to think like teachers. We need to carefully plan learning for our classes over time. And we need to take into account what is practically possible. As um, Rich and Yatsek were talking about in the last recording, um, some things are just not possible right now. But even within the realms of what is practically possible, we still need to think about some, some fundamentals. So number one, what do I really want to teach my students? How do you understand that one, Sally? Can you rephrase that one for me? Yeah, um, so I suppose it's, you know, we're stripping it down to the absolute bare bones of when we come back from, from being out of our classrooms, what do they absolutely have to have covered? What do they really need to have known? Um, and I think that's, that's a really, yeah, that's a really important way in to begin with is just to strip out all of the extraneous content, things that you, you know, all of those, those lovely things that, those like, lovely little anecdotes that we like to put in, perhaps, uh, you know, this isn't the best medium for sharing them. So, um, yeah, that's how I would, that's how I would characterise it. Yeah, so having decided, I think, what we really want to teach our students, then number two is... Um, what's the best way to teach it and and actually those are thoughts we always have aren't they how am i going to implement the learning what is the best way i can teach what i really need them to know and number three then i think is is about the impact um and again this is hard how am i going to know my students have learned this without being really tough on ourselves in a situation where everybody is struggling to work this one out we still need to give it some uh, consideration how am I going to know maybe not immediately maybe not in the same way that teachers often do by looking in kids eyes and knowing whether they've understood something and again Yetzik and Rich were talking a lot about the problems they're having in trying to um, handle misconceptions um, but how will we know at some point that our students have learned this so what are we actually planning to do how are we going to put it in place how are we going to have some idea of the impact it's had so that what we're doing isn't just chaotic time filling we've still got our learning has still got a sense of purpose a sense of direction um even within the uh, the, the different world that we're living in where do you want to take it next sam what do you think well so i think um that this is you've you've set me up perfectly here for um the idea of using an inquiry question to plan your learning now, obviously, I've always been a big fan of an inquiry question. Um, when I started to, to teach history years and years ago, that was the, the method that I was given um, to learn how to teach history. So, and I think it's even more important when you are planning learning from a distance. 
um, to add coherence to your um, to your study by coming up with a big overarching question that's going to connect a few lessons um, or weeks together. Okay, so a good example of that might be why was the Treaty of Versailles seen as an unfair treaty? Um, or something like how did the experience of occupation in World War II change Dutch society? So a nice big question um, that ties together all of the learning your students are going to be doing over the next few weeks. And then every lesson that you teach in between um, in, in that sequence is going to be a step towards answering the bigger question. So thinking about question one that I said there, so why was the Treaty of Versailles seen as an unfair treaty? Um, question one would need steps on what the treaty was and who made it, where it was made, the context that it was made in. Um, and I suppose then um, you would need to take different perspectives on the treaty and learn about the different people that held those perspectives both in 1919 and actually all the way up to 1939 and then also post World War II because perspective you know obviously continues we still have opinions today about the Treaty of Versailles um, so you would need to do some categorization of those perspectives as well and then once you've set up your inquiry question and the students have taken their steps towards answering it the final outcome is what you mark, and it's an answer to that question. Now, um, we'll, I've got a little bit on this later on. It could be recorded, it could be written, it could be drawn, it could be all kinds of different things. And there will be a later webinar on assessment uh, led by Anthony and Magella um, from Maynooth. Um, and the key difference here, I think, is that you might not necessarily be able to see what students are building up to answer the inquiry at the end. So I think that's, when you're in the classroom, you can, you can easily gauge whether students have got it um, by just being near them and being able to see them. Um, but it, you know, when you're doing that from a distance, it can be a lot more difficult um, to gauge that. So you need to be smarter about how you share information with students and also with what you expect them to do with it. And I think once you've got your question and you've got your sequencing, um, then you're, you know, you're on to a winner, really. Um, mm. So, but it, yeah, thinking carefully about how you're planning is really, really important. I don't know what you think, Helen, whether you... Yeah, no, I think that's really crucial. And even if you're actually setting them a chunk of a textbook, then you can still think as a teacher, what would be a big question that would draw this together? Otherwise, I think there's a danger that in isolation kids are doing things um one thing and then another thing and another thing so they have a pile of knowledge but they're not going to be able to do anything with it because they're going to be missing your teacher questioning the conversations that would normally go on in class and therefore to have a a question that that hangs it together that perhaps you can keep sort of um when you send them the instructions say right stop here think back at the question what's the view on the question stop here think back on the question now what's your view on the question it'll help them make some sense of all the stuff that, that you're giving them i think that's really brilliant so i think also we need to really think about reducing to the essential going back to basics as yapsek and rich said in the last podcast we can't do what we usually do in class we've got to change the quantity and the type of learning um, we've got to take a step back so something i've been thinking about in order to try and make the decisions is what do they got to know what have they got to know for september and next year as a whole but if they don't know it then it's going to make next year really really hard sometimes of course that's driven by um the big assessments that are coming up perhaps exams national tests but not always so when I look at um, my um, second year of secondary school and, and the term coming up, and I, I look at what we usually teach, I haven't got time to do it all. So I've taken a long, hard look and I'm thinking, okay, what has got to stay in there is the topic of the British Empire and the topic of the Industrial Revolution. Because if they don't have those, it's going to make 
next year's learning harder. So when they're learning about the early 20th century, if they don't know about the 19th century British Empire and the Industrial Revolution, then they're going to struggle. So that's helped me decide what to put in my online learning plan, but also what to cut out. So there was a local history project that was lovely, but I've had to let it go. And within that topic slate of the British Empire, I normally use a wide range of examples of Britain in different colonies, but actually I can reduce it um, and the kids will still come out with an idea about British rule, British government in different places um, and also they'll still come out of learning with an idea of what life was like in Britain in 1900, which will then mean they can make sense of next year's Britain in World War I topic. But at the same time, we can live without the study of welfare reforms in the 1900s if we have to. I don't want to lose it, but hard decisions have got to be made. And in order to get over some of the things I'm cutting, so I'm going to focus in more detail my lesson planning on the, the empire and industrialization. But I might find a short film for them to watch about the welfare reforms of the early 1900s. Or I might record me telling them the story, giving them a narrative instead, something quite short. But instead of trying to do a whole lesson on it, I just uh, plug, plug the gap um, with some facts, with some key concepts. Um, but it means that I can focus the reduced time we've got for core work on the key concepts, the key facts, the key ways of thinking, the key things they need to know about a certain time period so that we can keep moving forward next year um i guess you probably have to do the same so definitely i think you, it's difficult you know as historians i think or as history teachers we always think they can't possibly go forward if they don't know this we have to teach this they have to learn this but you know now is the time to have that hard conversation with yourself where you think mm, actually they probably could get away with not learning certain parts of the curriculum uh, just you know for because we're in a very special situation so once you've made those really difficult decisions um, about what you're going to include i think the other thing um to consider is what what methods you're going to use to teach and um, i think you you need to be just as um, brutal about cutting down um, on your choices there as well i think it's really important for distance learning that you have a common basic structure that you try to stick to um, as clearly as possible so nothing too fancy nothing too um, kind of unusual um, just so that students can have that consistency so that they know when they're going to uh, to open a lesson from you or if they're doing you know they choose when they're going to do it they know what to expect they know roughly how long it's going to take them I mean I find it very difficult to work out how long a task is going to take. So for the first couple of weeks of distance learning, I've made sure that I've asked my students, how long did this take you? Were you able to complete this within an hour? Um, and there's been a range of responses. Of course, some people yes, some people no, but that's mixed ability teaching. So it's trying to think about making sure that there's not too much and, and also that there's a scaffold. So what I'm doing with most of my classes are, are kind of 15, 14, 15 year olds, um, because that, that's the nature of the teaching that I do. So um, they're all preparing for their, their exam in, in, in 2021 in the summer. So um, I'm just focusing on getting through a lot of content. So we start with, with notes from the, the textbook, from the books that they've got. Um, and I tend to give them headings um, that they can take the notes under or give them a series of questions. And that's dependent on the material in the book, how clearly it's laid out, um, how complicated the topic is, um, and also on who the class is. So some classes I do give, give headings to, some just have the questions depending on you know, their ability really. Um, and once they've done those notes, what I do then is I give them a task that forces them to draw on those notes. And um, trying to think about something that's that's been my my main aim is trying to think about something there that really will be able to demonstrate to me that they have understood the content that they're covering so uh last lesson i gave them the task of writing an obituary for 
my favourite German 1920s politician, Stresemann. And if I was at school, um, I would follow this up with an exam question. But I'm mindful that this is going to build up a colossal amount of marking. Um, you know, I do want them to do this in their exercise books, really, because they will be revising from that. It's better that they have all of that in one place. So, but I, it's very difficult for me to then mark that. So um, I'm aiming to set those uh, using the question function on Google Classroom. Um, and students can, we're very lucky that we use Google Classroom. I think we're very lucky that it's, it's a very usable tool. And um, so students can then type their answers in as a response. Um, and I can give them a mark and some feedback on the classroom as well. And also because it's then shared with me, it's very difficult for me to print that for them and make sure that they've got it in, in their books when we eventually come back to school. So it's kind of, you know, it's not the most, um, I think if, if we were in, in a classroom, it wouldn't necessarily hold their interest for a full hour um, because it's what I, you know, it's a very um, nuts and bolts teaching or bread and butter teaching. It's just very same all the time. But I think that that's really important um, when you're doing distance learning because, like I said, I think that consistency is really key um i don't know what you think helen yeah i think that's completely right and uh, what i've done on the next few slides is try and show a few things that you can put in to um uh make make some make some comments on that now what i've what i've taken here is is a few examples of slides from a whole sequence to try and illustrate a bit about what we're talking about and the point i must stress to anybody listening to us here is not to understand this lesson I haven't given the uh, whole lesson because we'd be here till lunchtime and it wouldn't be relevant to most people. The purpose is to show how to add a few things on the slide so that you've got a consistency but at the same time, whatever your style is, that structure that Sal's talked about that's so important so kids know what's coming from you. But at the same time so that you can um, keep the learning um, as engaging as possible. So what you've got on this first one is the example of a hook. Um, this is um, a hook to get students engaged in the learning. And it might be that you decide to um, introduce that as your standard screen. And as Sally said, I'm um, equally not somebody that has ever advocated starting lessons in exactly the same way in classrooms because I think kids just get very bored. But I think for distance learning, we're in a different world. And actually, if you need to adopt the style of the slide, which means that, say, in this case, it always starts with a sticky post-it and a hook, they're going to feel comfortable. They're going to think, oh, I'm back with you. This is good. I know what I'm doing. I've settled into my work and perhaps distracting surroundings. So um, something that gets them hooked and connected in is what I was trying to um, show here. Okay, so then the next slide, this would be uh, my approach, it would be on the next slide that I'd introduce the inquiry question. And on this inquiry um, uh, question, um, obviously when they were looking at it as a slideshow, or I would send them notes to make this clear in case they didn't, the white shout out um, would click onto the screen later. Now the white shout out is simply the way I've developed as an example of something that if we were in class, I'd be saying this. This would be my teacher talk. The shout out wouldn't be needed. But because we're not in class and because I'm not there, I could either record it as a piece of audio, that would work too, but I could also just type the key information into the shout out. So read the question and then click again and you get the shout out of uh, what I would be saying, the call information. Um, the next slide then is purely an example again as remember i say these aren't coming in any order of the sequence at all i've cut bits out of the sequence so this is purely an example of where instead of more text i found a film clip and i've linked it in and then i've simply typed the questions alongside the film clip again not just leaving the kids to watch the film clip for something a bit different that's nice something on youtube from a historian but not just leaving them to listen to it and thinking, oh, what am I listening for? But actually giving them some questions so that when they're listening it, and watching, it focuses their uh, thinking. And then slide eight is an example of a lot of text. Yeah, they've got to, they've got to read this. Um, 
but what they're doing with it again is um if you can see at the very top of the screen they're to read it through and to there to highlight it in different colors so again it's an idea of making the learning active even though actually it's reading a piece of, of text so there's purpose to it um, and this is another part i think of making coherence out of chaos is that the tasks that i'm putting on each slide are guiding them through some thinking um, despite me physically uh, not being there um so i think you've got any illustrations of that as well sal yeah um I, I think those are great ideas um and i think that that one that you've just talked about there is is really good because it's very easy if you get that to submit them to you afterwards it's very easy to see whether they've done it or not um and whether it's you know whether they've just colored the whole thing red or whether they've really read it um and thought about about what that is um, and i think that's also a really good way of of sharing information because you know not all students have access to the books that you would um that you would be using in class um, and thinking about how you can share new content with students and um, that's also a bit of a conundrum and so you've got a big piece of text on this slide here and you also mentioned uh, recording a voiceover um, and you know recording yourself reading um pieces of text i think is a really good way of um sharing information with students um, in a, certainly as a sound file um, and you know i think maybe one one positive of the lockdown is that there's a lot of media that's now freely available that that hasn't been previously you've got a lot of people that are uh, making things available um, uh, online um, just for the for the the duration of the lockdown um, so it, it's you know there are lots of new sources of evidence that you can uh, or information sorry that you can send your students towards and um, I think it's easier to set some of this stuff for distance learning um, I find it really you know I, I love a podcast but I find it really difficult to listen to a podcast or a radio broadcast in the classroom. I just, I feel really awkward. I'm just kind of like, hmm, like standing, sitting at the front of the class, like while we're listening to this person reading, thinking, well, should I be, should I be doing that? So I think it works, however, really, really well for, um, for distance learning. So setting up a lesson um, based around a, a documentary or an online source of information um, is also a, a really good, good way to go I think um, but I think the really important thing is to chunk it down into small manageable parts you know you know when you put a longer clip on for students in the classroom and you can tell when their interest is gone you know they're like they're nodding a little bit so you can't see that when you're um, at a distance so I think it's you know what you need to do is to think about okay well let me let me split this up so that I know that they're going to be able to focus on it for the full amount of time. And you could set that over a series of lessons, or you could use it to complement other lessons that you're doing. And then hopefully thinking about um, last week's uh, uh, recording, there'll be you'll be able to use that when you get back into the classroom. So I've put onto the slides um, an example that I made before Easter. Um, and in a way, it's a bad example because it is a, a bit of a one-off um, that I planned rather than being part of an inquiry. Um, and I put it together initially to be delivered in school to mixed age students. Um, as you know, Helen, we're, we're open for uh, key workers, children um, here in the UK. So um, I made this uh, for them, but I've tried to put it together in a way that would also work for distance learning. And it's based on the documentary series Civilizations, um, and I'm accessing that via iPlayer, where it's episode four, this one, um, but it's also available on YouTube. I assume it's available everywhere. Weirdly, it is lesson three, episode three, sorry, on YouTube. Um, so, but I, you know, you can, you <clears throat> Those of you that are watching, you're welcome to click through and have a look at that lesson. You're, what you'll see is that each section of the documentary has questions that go with it. And I've put a screenshot there of the first section. Um, and those questions, you know, generally they're, they're sort of information questions, but I've also included some broader discussion questions as well. Um, and how you use those, you know, is, is going to depend on your class, the age, 
what the topic is and thinking about what your intent is, what you want to get out of that by the end. So you can gather info, you can gather your answers to those questions via a Google form, which should provide a, a really easily scanned spreadsheet of responses. You just have a look. You can check in with students who might be struggling. You're able to see the answers. Um, and then the discussion questions, they can be done by any kind of, of live online teaching session you're doing, if you're, if you're doing those through video, audio or text chat. Or if you wanted to, you know, thinking of, about your students and how they work, you could assign discussion groups and have students talk it through with each other via their own media. And I did a little poll with my students before um, Easter just to check that they were accessing my Google Classroom really about what, what are you going to do when we get out of lockdown? What's the first thing you're going to do? And the vast majority of the most popular answer was, I'm going to see my friends. And they missed their friends. You know, I, I'm lucky I live with my husband, you know, he's the person I would choose to hang out with. But um, for them, they, they're not necessarily seeing those friends. So giving them, I think, giving them something that they can do with their friends um, and, so, you know, the, in, in their choice of space. Um, can be really helpful in, in having those discussions. Yeah, that's a lovely human way of looking at it. And we are lucky. There are some fabulous historical documentaries out there. And as you said earlier, they've been making more and more freely available at the moment. And so grabbing those and actually making them the structure of some learning, why not? Absolutely fantastic. Um, and something that's quite uh, we're quite passionate about, aren't we, Sally, is actually oral history. And um, if you're lucky enough to be teaching topics at the moment that happen to be in the second half of the 20th century, then another way to build some coherence for those topics is actually to use the oral history in families. Um, and of course, people are very much thrown together with their families at the moment, or are connecting with them online quite a lot. And possibly, um, you know, conversations may be getting a little... Uh, um, uh, stale because you know nobody's doing anything so here's a way of perhaps judging them up and step one is to is to actually ask students to identify a family member and to talk to them generally about um, where they lived what their work was in the second half of the 20th century all those sorts of general questions um, something connected to the period you're working on it might be the 50s or the 60s uh, you might be lucky enough to be able to get people that can remember right back into the into the European War period. Then, as you study different topics in the 20th century, if you've got that baseline of information, if you've got that contact with that family member and that sense of their past life, as you then study topics, you can keep asking students to ask the family member what they remember. Um, so it might be that you're studying um, the time of the Vietnam War. What do you remember about the Vietnam War on the news? Um, you're likely to find the answer is not much, which itself is quite interesting as to, as to how much big world events actually penetrate um, the everyday. But if you keep asking the family member what they remember about each event, it's a nice way to make the topics, again, you're studying really real. Um, and the topics hopefully will then be part of a life that the students are interested in, and that'll give it some coherence. And you may actually find, if, again, if you pick up some of the ways that I've been talking about, about giving um, students the chance to do some feedback, do some chatting with each other, that there are some really interesting, specific um, and diverse perspectives that emerge. You might even want to record some of them by, by sound files or text for the future. So they might find out that some family member actually had a role uh, uh, in some part of, of a big event that you're studying and then that is really fascinating to share with everybody. And if you find that that person really doesn't remember anything about the event, then as I said before, that's, that's interesting in itself. Why might people who live during times that we think of now as historically interesting not remember the main events very well at all? Well, perhaps there wasn't the media to communicate. Perhaps they were busy getting married and having their own children and were involved in a different uh, part of their own past. There are all sorts of reasons, but that itself can be really useful ways in to making kids reflect on how we remember about the past and, and, and how we create history. Um, but yeah, Sal, what would you add to that? We love this topic, don't we? Oh yeah, I mean, this, was, this has been a favourite project of mine for a really long time now is to get my uh, my 13 and 14 year old students to discuss 
um, with an with an older family member their memories and then move forward um, in researching the, the historical events that they remember. And I, I just think it brings out some amazing stories um, about what people's uh, families have been involved in. And you can tell when you're when the students are sharing that back, you can tell that that a lot of those 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 grandparents those older older the older generation they they really are very happy about being asked and they're really happy to share and kind of you know some of them really proud of the things that they've been involved in um and i think that's you know it's great at a time when we are trying to be more connected as you know particularly well, digitally and um, since we can't be connected um in person i think that that setting up your students to go away and talk to older generations it really brings those generations together um, and it can it can kick off some quite interesting further research for them so you know even if you're not studying uh, second half of the 20th century there are lots of um, there's lots of opportunities about for making this an enrichment um, so that you're setting up students for future learning of, of kind of second half of the 20th century and also really with just connecting with their their own the history of, of their own family and where they've come from so where i work in bristol um i i teach quite a diverse community of students and was well, the first time i set this project for them to do when we were in school i learned more about the somali civil war than yeah, then I, I, I don't I don't even know if I knew there had been a Somali civil war, which is awful. Um, so but when they came back with those stories, um, it was it was a fascinating piece of learning for all of us. So I can definitely recommend um, doing those oral history projects um, that we yeah, we've talked about before, haven't we? And we really love them. Yeah, that's a really democratic classroom. But if you also want to uh, break out of your local community, if you feel for whatever reason your local community of, of kids may be um, bringing very much one perspective onto something, then um, Historian has actually got some um, sets of memories already available. So if you click on the Historiana website, then you'll find a set of uh, stories of people from across Europe from the 1945 to 49 period. So in that crucial period where Europe is emerging from a, from a terrible, terrible war, and um, very soon available, and uh, if you want them, um, send a message directly because we'll be able to get them to you somehow, um, are a set of memories of how people not dealt with so much because it was perhaps it was more optimistic time for most people, but what their lives were like as a result of what had happened in 1989 in Europe and uh, um, how uh, lives played out across the continent in that um, last decade of the 20th century so again if you want things that are transnational and taking on many perspectives then as ever um, Eurocleo and Historiana will be able to um, help you and I think that's um, taking us on to projects and and wider learning more generally um, and um, we're very very aware that homes are incredibly different and we can't do a lot about this and I know teachers everywhere are worried about certain kids that they know are just going to be really, really struggling in this, this lockdown. Some kids just can't do as much, maybe due to illness, maybe they can't get access to the online devices, maybe the space they live in is just not conducive to doing a lot of work. Um, so that's why we've been talking a lot today about reducing the core learning but conversely, some kids are going to need lots to do. And, and that could also be partly because they've got time, but it, it might be also because they need to escape from what is around them because home is not a great place. And I think that oral history project is an example of a project um, that they could do, but we've, we've got some more. Um, so, uh, Sal, what, what, what have you done with book groups? Um, well, it, it... We, I haven't done anything yet, actually. But um, what I've, what I'm hoping to do, particularly with my, uh, with my A-level students, my students that are 17, um, 16 and 17, is to find some um, books uh, that are available online through, I don't know, through Google Books or find um, that are free on Kindle, something similar to that, um, and get us reading together some historical fiction um, that is relevant to their next topic. Um, so we're, you know, next um, next year going to move on to look at um, Edward the Sixth, um, Edward the 
yeah, Edward the um, Sixth with my uh, A level. So um, I'm looking at possibly setting them um, the latest uh, book by C.J. Sansom, which covers Tombland, it's called, which covers one of the big uh, rebellions in that time. So historical fiction, I think, is a really good a good way in. Um, it's a nice thing, I think, a, a more accessible thing for students to read. Um, as a big reader of fiction myself, that's what I think. Um, but also chunks of, of um of history uh, books that they might not necessarily have the time to read um, or the um, motivation to read at home, uh, at school, sorry. Um, they, they are more likely to read at home. Um, there's also quite a lot of free books available on Audible now um, during this for the duration of lockdown to allow students um, to uh, listen to books would would also encourage discussion and again you can have those discussions um, via any any medium you know you could do that if you if you're a classroom that uses uh, zoom or uh, video chat that would work um, but even just a text chat or an email discussion um, I think is a really good way of just getting students to focus on the history and keep it in their well in their minds really yeah, yeah absolutely I noticed that E.H. Gombrich is um Little History of the World is one of the ones they've made free on Audible Books, which should be fab, wouldn't it, for everybody to, to listen to. And um, actually, a historical fiction list, which is um, accessible to anybody and everybody, if you go on the um, site One Big History Department, that's all one word, onebighistorydepartment.com, there's a complete historical fiction list there. Um, well, uh, it's all in the English language, but um, may be useful to all sorts of people. So, uh, for ideas for historical fiction for for all sorts of ages, that could be that could be good. I think there are also out there some really good lists of film clips. I know I put these together years ago for my um, uh, older students when they were revising for their exams as something that would just be a bit of relief from reading the textbook and reading their exercise books and learning the stuff. Um, and I put lists together of uh, YouTube clips that fitted all the topics. But in fact, some teachers have already done that. So um, if you were to track down on YouTube, Mr. Alsop History, uh, he's based in Romania, is Scott Alsop. And he's put a whole list together of different uh, YouTube short clips. Um, so has uh, Russell Tarr. Russell's based in uh, Toulouse, in the south of France, or near Toulouse. Uh, he's put a whole load together online so you can... Um, you can steal other people's. I know here in the UK from next Monday, the BBC is putting education is going to educate the nation with school programmes every day. So maybe national broadcasters in other countries, I'm sure, are always going to be doing the same things. Um, you can also tap up your national museums, national galleries, etc., to see what they're putting out there. Um, yeah, because all sorts of people are scrambling to, to be in the online space that we find ourselves in. So uh, it's worth having a good look around to see what's become available in the last couple of weeks since yeah. everything perhaps calmed down just a little bit. Yes, and I, I think that that's, you know, that's a real, you can really take advantage of that at the moment. Um, you know, my, my oldest students um, are, are starting their, their long essay that they need to submit uh, next year. Um, and uh, normally what I'd say to them is you don't don't anticipate that you'll be able to research for this project online. You need to go to a library, you need to open some books. But I think that actually, you know, now is a good time to look at what is really available online and what has become available online. Um, so supporting those students in, in researching online and also in developing their own inquiry questions um, is something that I'm going to be focusing on um, over the next few weeks simply because um, the landscape is I think changing very quickly um, and what's possible um, it, it, you know more is becoming possible every day with this. Yeah and that's for the really older students isn't it? Our A-level in the UK is pretty sort of 16, 17, 18 year old students the ones that are approaching university age so uh, that's that older end yeah. Yeah and um, you know, with with a project like that, you know, I won't have to worry about assessing um, them until next year, until this time next year. But I think assessment um, is the the kind of final thing for us to say. And I know that there is a going to be another um, broadcast about this in a few weeks, so I won't go to town on it. But um, just a few different ideas, um, really. That that there are so many different ways that you can use to 
gather your um, your assessment. But I think it's quite important to try to be consistent with that as well. So um, for longer answers, you know, I know that, that we both use Google Docs um, and it's good you can comment um, on, on, leave comments for students so that they can add stuff. Um, I also um, mentioned that I, I use Google, um, uh, Google Classroom. So I put, uh, use an ask a question feature on Google Classroom in order to, um, to gather those responses and just have them all in one place. Um, or if you're using something else that my school is experimenting with is Microsoft Teams, um, which is, um, a, you, can, you can attach documents to there as well. For me, the, the important thing is about keeping it, as I said, consistent, but also keeping it simple. You know, the, the, when I look at the number of students that I'm, I'm trying to um, assess, it, you, you know, we're getting on for 100 students um, and if they're all sending me a separate email with an attachment, I'm going to drown. <laughs> so I need those things uh, to come in, in, in just kind of one or two forms in a way that, that is quite easily accessible to me. And I don't feel guilty about making it easy for me because I think, you know, they, they may have lots of different subjects to do, but, um, you know, they're really only doing one piece of work for me, remembering what I said before about, just making that assessment at the end um, of the inquiry question. Um, and something else I, I think though would be really interesting to do would be to do verbal assessments using voice notes, um, using voice recordings. You know, a few years ago, um, I used to, I, I trialed doing this in my classroom. So I had a big walk-in cupboard at the back of my room and I put some lights in it and a deck chair and an iPod and the students would record verbally their response to a question and then um, I would listen to that and I would record a response back and then the following lesson they'd put headphones on and they would listen to my response um, and, and we kind of had a dialogue and I you know it was a, it was an interesting experiment although the the you know maybe not particularly necessary when you're in a classroom to do that but that is the sort of thing that's going to work really well and hopefully really cut down on your marking load. I am a lot quicker speaking than I am at writing. And um, I think it's, you know, how, being able to record that dialogue and send it backwards and forwards um, is, can be really powerful. I probably wouldn't record a video for students just because once you've got your, your face on a screen in their homes, you don't really know what they're going to do with that. Um, but uh, certainly voice notes, um, I'm, I'm very keen for. And um, I think it's also, you know, you can do quick assessments as well. And there are so many different ways that you can do that. Um, I've just popped a few on the, the slide. So Google Forms, there's also Microsoft Forms, um, even SurveyMonkey, lots of different ways to gather um, just just quick snapshot of what students can remember. Um, but above all, I think the really important thing here is to just just assess what you value. You know, the, the little um, formative assessment tools that you use in the classroom, they don't necessarily work here. You don't know what students, you know, they've got their list that they're reading off. They, they, you're not necessarily testing what's gone into their minds. So just making sure that you think hard about what it is that you value and how you're going to assess that. Um, and that's, I think, how you're going to be successful. Um, I don't know whether you've got anything to add, Helen. No, I think that's a really good summary. And I know Magella and Anthony will, will expand on assessment massively in future. And I think that gets us started with our coherence um, coherence idea of today. So I think probably we better summarise, haven't we? We better, better wrap up. Um, and so really, here's what we've been saying, hopefully. Plan learning as normal in terms of use the same approach to planning think about your what you're trying to achieve how you're going to achieve it how you're going to know you've achieved it plan your content differently though bearing in mind that you just can't do as much give them a consistent structure because in an uncertain world that's a bit scary where they can't see you and they can't check in with you they're going to need to feel safe but do plan some variety within that structure so that uh, it doesn't get too stale and then as Sal's just said, do assess some key outcomes, but decide what those key outcomes are and don't overburden yourselves. And um, go wild on the uh, projects that could link and extend. Um, let's make use of all these uh, incredible places that are offering us uh, wonderful opportunities. Let's uh, take the uh, very positive out of the, uh, the very negative. 
I hope that's a good summary and uh, um, I hope you found it useful, Sal and I uh, chatting um, openly on webinar about this topic of uh, chaos out of coherence and I think all it remains to do is to say uh, thank you for listening and please stay well and safe and um, hope to see many of you on the other side of this strange experience.